We're all human beings. And as human beings, we all experience sensations, feelings, emotions, and thoughts. Look at it that way, from the deepest level to the uh, surface level. We all experience sensations, bodily sensations, bodily feelings, emotions, right the way through to thoughts. We experience these. Now, that word to use is really important. They emerge. They happen to us out of the blue or based on what's going on in the world around us. And he's here. He is here. Cristiano has entered the building. Welcome to the Old Trafford Theatre. Yes, guys, welcome back to today's episode of Sculpted. Today, we have Dan Abrams here. This is an absolute honor for us. Uh, it's it's a massive guest, and it's a great insight for anyone listening to understand everything about human psychology and its links to performance and how you can utilize all these different ways of sculpting yourself in ways that you, you don't even know. Because seriously, Dan, I've listened to Dan for, I think, three years now. And the amount of knowledge that he's got, speaking with people from all around the world, speaking to people in all these different niches, and it, it's really amazing to get an insight into Dan's brain and all of the experiences that he's had. So, Dan, that being said, if you could just give our listeners a quick little background on what you've been doing and what you're passionate about. Well, thanks so much, Nick, and I'm delighted and honoured to be here. Um, I'll keep this brief. Dan Abrahams is my name. Um, I'm a sports psychologist. I used to be a professional golfer. I wasn't a very good professional golfer. Always wondering what was going on between my two ears. I coached golf um, and I had just had a real interest at that time um, as I was playing and then as I was coaching on the mental aspect, not just of golf, but of sport and maybe even of life in general. And so that led me on a, a path, a journey, if you like, to, to learning more by doing my qualifications as a sports psychologist. And for the last 17, 18 years, I've been a, a, a sports psychologist, principally working in two sports, although I work across multiple sports. But those two sports would be golf and football. And I would say football, soccer, would be my main sport. I've worked with a number of Premier League clubs. I've been blessed to work with some of the best players in the world, some of the um, best coaches. Uh, currently, right now, this season, I've been working with Feyenoord, who, fortunately enough, are at the top of the Eredivisie in the Dutch League, um, just fending off Ajax as we speak. Hopefully, by the time this goes to air, they won't be in second place by then. Um, and, uh, yeah, just really uh, work globally with players and with coaches, with organisations, with teams. And um, I have uh, four books, three of which are, are football soccer books, one of which last year, Gareth, or two years ago now, Gareth Bale kindly uh, said changed his life. That book is Soccer Tough. So uh, that's me, uh, Nick. So thanks for inviting me. Yeah, I mean, then I think that that says it all. It's, it, it's crazy. I guess the amount of teams and the experiences that you've had in all, all sports. I, I know your book, Soccer Tough. And I, I, I saw the, uh, Gareth Bell saying how it's, yeah, it, it's amazing. And your introduction there, it speaks wonders to anyone who's listening right now. And for our 10th, I think actually, sorry, this is our 11th episode to have someone of your your stature and your accomplishments and everything like that. It's genuinely an honor. So yeah, uh, well, let's kick the, uh, the the episode off and let's yeah. go Val, uh, your three questions for Dan. Yeah, uh, so let me start off with very briefly in one of your most recent episodes you had with uh, Dr. Dale well in hand, if I pronounce this correctly, uh, you talked about the uh, topic of managing fatigue. I really enjoyed the episode, but I thought the focus was more on, on physical aspects. I want to specifically ask you, what are some strategies to apply fatigue management for your mental side? Really good question. And obviously, you've, you've, you're really uh, alluding to my conversation with Dale um, uh, on my podcast, The Sports Psych Show. 
um and um so mental mental fatigue let me uh, let me uh, um answer it this way um Val, let's keep this nice and simple and nice and practical i say to players uh one percent of your day is about 15 minutes right once it's like 16 minutes and 20 seconds but let's call it 15 minutes right for simplicity purposes <laughs> One percent of your day is fifteen minutes. I say this to players: players in the Premier League, players in 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 lower leagues. It doesn't matter the skill in your feet. It doesn't matter the quality of your game. Um, train, train as as hard and as intense and as focused as you can. Do your extras, whatever that looks like. Go into the gym. Do that, whatever you like to do. And then strive to get away from the game after that. That is your mental rest, which is most of the rest of the day. However, 1% of your day, around 15 minutes, take some time to mentally rehearse your game. That might be mentally rehearsing imaging visualizing is another term we use or just i like to call it picturing you know your best games your dream games who you want to be out there, how you want to play a nine out of ten game a high performance mindset you might be picturing mentally rehearsing the skills that you're working on at that particular time just for 15 minutes a day it can be a pocket of two minutes here a pocket of three minutes there give yourself that time and then get away from the game. Why get away from the game? Two reasons, two reasons. We need that mental rest for two reasons. Firstly, what we pretty much know in science is that when you are spending all day, every day, thinking about your game, thinking about it, you go in, you train, you do your gym work, you come away, you're constantly, so many players get in contact with me and say, Dan, I'm, you know, I'm always thinking about my game. Well, stop. Because what we know is that the, your nervous system is releasing adrenaline as you're thinking. So it's depleting your stores of adrenaline. And that's stores that you need for tomorrow when you're going to go and train again. Or this afternoon or this evening when you're going to go and train or when you're going to go and play. You need those stores of adrenaline. The other thing that we know from a brain perspective is your brain is powered by glucose and sugars. Again, what we know is when you're thinking, 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 you're depleting your stores of sugars and glucose. And that's why you can overthink and be exhausted. You can exhaust yourself, not just de-energize yourself, but exhaust yourself. So you must have that mental rest. That mental rest is essentially getting away from the game, doing something else, immersing yourself in another world, being else elsewhere, get away. You overthinking the game or thinking constantly about the game deserves limits um, your chances of training effectively the next day or performing well that night. Train, do your extras, do your gym work, whatever you do. Give yourself 15, around 15 minutes of extra thinking time, then get away from it. That is vitally important. I am saying that to every player that I'm working with always that's that's huge um and i i want to give a little side story of myself um uh, in the last few months i've been more and more actively working on my mental side um because i i believe in the past i've been or i've been restricted with some injuries because of my subconscious mind because of, of, of i was too much involved with overthinking uh, of of needing to perform and whatsoever so in the last few months I have a very, very simple exercise. It's called um, finding my chi. I tried many different meditation um, things, but for example, this meditation exercise works for me. So I sit down five minutes each day, I do it two times a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, and I just breathe um, through my nose and try to really breathe and try to feel where is the air going through my body, just getting a sense of uh, do I even feel my body anymore and so yeah that's the exercise that works for me but I think it's so incredibly important to work on your mental side of things uh, and that you don't start uh, or that you start 
as soon as possible. And I think what you just said about the visualization is a big part as well. Uh, just to speak to what you said there, Val, I love what you're doing. I think that's brilliant. And again, being a sports psychologist, so much of what I do is underpinned by science. And so I would say to you that, again, there's pretty good evidence that when you are doing that meditation or mindfulness, that you are reducing your stress levels. And when you're reducing your stress levels, you're not releasing um, much as much cortisol, not cortisone, cortisol. Cortisol is your stress hormone. And what we know from some studies is that too much cortisol can leave you susceptible to injury and can slow down re injury rehab. So I love what you're doing there. It's a really good thing that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, touching base, touching on, base what on what you said in the previous answer, answer about, about picturing, picturing visualization. I have a question for you. Mm. Um, what, what role does visualization, visualization play in performance enhancement and how can athletes use it effectively? Maybe some small strategies or tips you can give our listeners. It's a great question. It plays a role. Sometimes I do think there are some overblown statements that are made around mental rehearsal, visualization, imagery. You know, the, 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 the sayings visualize to realize and you've got to believe it to achieve it and, and things like that. And I, I think sometimes those things are a little bit unrealistic. Let's be clear. You're probably not going to become Lionel Messi just because you are engaged in imagery. You're probably not going to become Alex Morgan just because you are picturing your performance. That's not what this is all about. There is some evidence that when you take time to uh, use mental rehearsal. So when we when, when we say mental rehearsal, we're really talking more than visualization because we're talking about more senses, not just seeing it, but also feeling it kinesthetically, our, you know, bodily sensations, our bodily feelings, and maybe even our emotional feelings are, uh, as well. So we're feeling it and seeing it, maybe even hearing it. That's mental rehearsal. So it's important to look at it from that, that perspective. There's some evidence to suggest that we can build skill this way. So you might, in your mind, engage in mental rehearsal around, and I'll keep it very basic here, shooting. So you might, for example, ex uh, in your own mind, experience the ball at your feet and taking a shot and feel like, you know, feel the kind of strike you want on the ball, putting your foot through it, for example, off your laces, bang, and see that shot powerfully go away. You might think about getting on top of the ball with your body. Maybe if you have a tendency to lean back, again, I'm keeping this very basic here, but it might be something specific in your technique that you're working on at the moment with your coaches. And so there is some evidence to suggest that we speed up the development of skill technique in this way. What we might also do is for instance, picture the kind of responses we want in games. So we might imagine ourselves going a goal down and mentally rehearse how we're going to respond in that situation. Or perhaps we might consider a situation where we've, I don't know, had a poor five minutes and what we're going to do for the next five minutes, how we're going to respond, the body language we want to have, what we might want to say to ourselves. Um, the kind of movements and actions we might engage in in that circumstance. So that has a motivational feel to it. Um, one thing I would say to everybody listening in is I wouldn't be so um, concerned about things like outcomes, um, like winning one nil or winning the trophy and picking up the trophy. They may have an impact on how you feel in the moment. But by and large, those things aren't necessarily going to help you be a better player. They may have a small impact on how you feel, which might have a bigger impact on your day, granted. But it's really getting lost in amongst the many things that you've got to do on the pitch and start mentally rehearsing that. Think about the responsibilities in your role, the tasks, the actions you've got to execute in your role. 
what does that look like? What does that feel like? What will others see if you're engaging in those tasks? That's a really useful thing to do. Now, my last thing to say here to this question is think about what I just did there. I asked myself some questions. What will it look like if? Um, what will it feel like? What will others see when? If we can ask ourselves questions, we are, our, our brain and body is almost forced to answer those questions. For instance, what will it look like today when I go and play and compete? If I do so in my best mindset, if I do so with great body language, what will that look like and feel like? I ask myself a question. I'm then forced to answer it. So I think that's a really useful way to instigate, to start this process of mental rehearsal. Use all of your senses and make your mental rehearsal as specific as is possible. Not just general holding aloft the trophy. That really doesn't mean much. Make it specific to your game, specific to the challenges that you face. And then just take some time to mentally rehearse. I will actually have one more thing here. This is definitely the last thing. <laughs> don't panic if you don't see, you know, if you're not picturing things particularly clearly, clearly. Clearly, Just get an impression on your mind and an impression through your body. That's enough in terms of rehearsing what you want to do. That's enough. It doesn't have to be this big picture in front of you. That's what I'd say to your question. I think that the last part is is very big in terms of not being very harsh with yourself when it doesn't work out on the first try. You know, it's the learning experience. Uh, you have to sculpt yourself in that way. Uh, it doesn't always happen on the first try, but it's a process. And like if we train, we want to improve, we want to get better. For example, when I do my meditation exercise at the beginning or even now, it's still hard for me to concentrate only on my breathing. My thoughts come and go and whatsoever. But go, uh, going one step further now to my final question of one, techni one technique or one exercise you have for athletes in particular um, to focus or to improve their focus and concentration during games or practice. Maybe one small key uh, in, in tip that can have a bigger impact in that situation if they are frustrated, overwhelmed, uh, or maybe it's not going the right way in, in, in their perspective. Maybe they have one trigger point that they can access to maybe um, shift their mindset. Yeah, sure. Great question. Um, I think my first go-to answer that I'm going to give you two answers. Answer okay. number one, if you're dealing with an, a team invasion sport like football, soccer, but it could also be uh, basketball, it could be rugby. Um, when you're distracted, by and large, and I'm not saying every time, but by and large, it tends to be in your own head. Get out of your head and make your attention external. We can have an external focus of attention. We can have an internal focus of attention. We can have a broad focus of attention. We can have a narrow focus of attention. The best players in the world, if we're talking football, soccer here, but any team sport tend to be the ones who as often as possible have an external focus of attention where they're looking, they're searching for the cues, the clues, the triggers that ignite their next action. And so we can stand there and think just next action, next action. That's what you can do, but probably better still is to make sure that you strive to keep your focus of attention as external as possible for as long as possible. That doesn't mean we never go inside of ourselves. Maybe we have to some of the time to motivate ourselves or to instruct ourselves, but keep your focus of attention external and keep searching for cues, clues, triggers. Keep looking, keep searching, keep searching, keep searching. Great players are great detectives. The world's greatest scanner was Javi Hernandez. He was a great detective as to what was going on in the pitch. He was constantly searching for cues and clues and triggers that um, helped him focus in general and focus on his next action. A final thing to say here is what I wrote uh, about in my first book, Soccer Tough, and I've always written about, is just to take with you to a game three um, attentional cues 
related to the game that you're going to be playing, related to the tasks in your role or the actions in your role, strengths you want to magnify, weaknesses or coaching points that you're striving to improve upon at the moment. I'll give you a working example. I I'm working with a very good striker right now who plays in the Premier League. His three attentional cues, he's obviously striving to keep his um, attention external when he's constantly scanning, especially scanning the defenders to try to get in between and behind them, around them, and so on and so forth. But he's got three attentional cues that act as his main objectives. One is uh, constantly look for space, which is related to what I've just said. The other one is um, 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 attack the six yard, as in attack six yard area on a crossing ball. That's also a specific cue in a specific moment. But if he's distracted, he comes back to remind himself, OK, that's one of my objectives today. And the other one is, I believe it's a bit more complicated than this, but it's it, it's around linking up with the midfield. You know, it's kind of showing for it uh, with, with with good body shape and then being ready to hold the ball up. It's a little bit uh, uh, more succinct than that, but that's, that, that's what it is. So not only is this player striving to keep an external focus of attention, but he's also got these mini cues that act as game objectives that are, that are relevant to his role that he can come back to should they go a goal down and he starts to get a bit despondent. Should he feel that, oh, the ball's not coming up to me and he starts getting a bit frustrated, no, come on, keep doing these things. That's the way. Those are some ways to stay focused. Like setting your own objective task list. Uh, I think that's a big part. Um, so I hand it over to Nick. Yeah, cool, cool. Before you come on, Nick, I call that a match script in my books, a match script. It's just a script for your game, as simple as that. Yeah, I actually, I'll quickly just add to that. Something that I have uh, for every training session, for every game is... Similar to what I believe you were even saying for uh, the second question that Val had uh, of, I, I call them process goals. So rather than focusing on when you were talking about visualization, you were talking about it's not necessarily the best thing to visualize the main goal of, let's say, winning the trophy, right? That's not going to necessarily help you visualizing you. So focusing on the process goals, yes. those are the things that you control right now. And these are the things that you can visualize to make yourself better in that moment. And then even to help you get back into the moment, right? If you're focusing on external things like, oh, I can see my mum in the crowd. Oh, the ball's at my foot. Well, if I think, oh, sorry, I need to just think about my, my process goals. You're back in the moment now. And I think that's that's a massive one. Yeah, and, and, and to speak to your point, I'm going to come away from football. I'm working with a very, very good UFC fighter at the moment who's at a very top level of the game and lost his last fight because he became preoccupied walking into the octagon by his opponent's supporters and how vocal they were. You know, so this happens to the very best players. I work with footballers who say, yeah, I got distracted by that section of the crowd there who have been on my back or, you know, that striker was just on top of me, a defender here, that striker was so on top of me. I was just, I just couldn't get hold of myself. So this happens to the very best competitors in the world. They need tangible things, techniques that they can uh, be able to, that help them to flex their focus of attention, flex their mindset when they need to. So control is a, is a word you used and it's a really good word. What can I control is a really good starting point for these kind of things. Yeah, 100%. I, I think it's, yeah, it's brilliant that you've got all these these uh, experiences and you've got direct people who you've, you're working with currently who our listeners can, can grab these golden nuggets and understand that I think something that not many people can really understand about high performers and the people who are at the top is that they are humans too. It's crazy, right? But I, I even get caught up of it. Like, I don't realize that Ronaldo's actually human. I genuinely think that this guy, I don't even get how he's got the same consciousness as me. Like, it's crazy to think that he actually has negative thoughts. It's, it, blows, it blows everyone's minds when you actually listen to things like this, right? Um, 
that being said, the the next so my question that I've got for you, Dad, is nerves and anxiety is a massive thing for I would say particularly younger footballers. It can be crippling sometimes, right? Now I want to I'd say if we just go through a few ways of which you can actually, and I know this is probably something where you're quite uh, knowledgeable in, so scientific ways that are easily easily applicable to anyone, such as maybe breathing and visualizing, things like this, what are ways you can manage your nerves? It's a really good question. Um, and, you know, when I was a professional golfer, I absolutely experienced crippling nerves. I feel I go around the world now talking to audiences and I feel more comfortable. I was in Poland a couple of years ago speaking to a thousand coaches, none of whom spoke English in this auditorium. And I felt quite, quite comfortable. Honestly, mate, if you stuck me when I was a golfer in front of 10 people watching me tee off, I was, I was terrified. I was nervous. Hence why I had never made any money as a professional golfer. It's not a good position to be. Um, so, um, uh, look, uh, there's no doubt that some nerves can help. There's so many ways I can answer this. Uh, often what we say in psychology is it, it starts with the perception you have of the ex of the feelings that you're experiencing. Yeah. Let me say that again. It's the perception you have of the feelings that you're experiencing. What we know from science, actually, is that the feelings of nerves are actually physiologically no different to the feelings of excitement. They're the same, it's just that you're putting a different, different label onto them. And when you really sit down and think about that, when you get excited, yeah, you, you have that, you know, um, that heart, your heart rate increases and you, you, you get a bit, you, you, you know, your, your stomach feels a bit butterfly like, um, you get all of those sensations. In this instance, though, we're going into a game, perhaps that feels big to you. So those feelings are described as nerves. Now, there's lots of ways of, of looking at this, but even just starting from that, uh, from that position of, hey, look, I'm feeling nervous. Label it. Use your self-talk. I'm talking to myself here. Hey, I am feeling nervous. That's okay. That's natural. That is also an excitement. My body is getting ready to play. This is a big game. I can't wait to go and play and use these nerves that are helping my body get ready to play. So we're talking to ourselves and changing the perception that we have of the feelings that we're experiencing. That can work for some people. It doesn't necessarily work for everybody. But it can work for some people. It's just to use your self-talk to talk to yourself and change. The word we use in psychology is reframe. I'm reframing that towards something that's more positive rather than seen as or, or helpful rather than seen as unhelpful. So that's the start. It's recognizing and identifying that you're going to have some nerves. That's OK. This is me being excited. Um. I think it's important to make sure, speaking to some of the things that we've spoken about so far, that you are taking charge of your focus of attention. When we're experiencing the kind of feelings that are associated with nerves, we tend to focus on those feelings. We tend to focus on the feelings in our stomach, in our chest. Well, let's start to focus on our objectives, our match script, the controllable game cues. I'm feeling nervous, right? But let's. What am I going to do today? What will it look like if I stick to my match script today? The tasks in my match script. That's my job. So I'm directing my attention away from being internal, from those feelings, towards something practical around what I've got to do that day. I can do that whilst engaged in another technique, which is breathing, as we've spoken about so far. Now, I love 
something called heart rate variability, HRV, heart rate variability, which is super simple, which is five seconds in, five seconds out, five seconds in, five seconds out. So you are slowing down your breathing rather than having shallow breaths. Five seconds in, five seconds out. So it's a cycle of six breaths a minute. So I can be doing that five seconds in, five seconds out. And then I can be mentally rehearsing the plays, the cues in my match script. Yeah. Those are little things that you can potentially do. There's a host of things, but that's useful. Above all, last thing for me here is that um, nerves, when they're not dealt with very well, tends to cause inhibition out there on the pitch. When we're inhibited, we stop moving. So with that in mind, nerves hate action. Take action. Hold yourself tall. Move, run. If you're, if you're standing still because your position demands that and, and demands it in the moment, hold yourself tall. Hold yourself ready. Ready for action. Keep taking action as often as you can, because inhibition is non -a no action. Nerves create inhibition, so thus nerves hate action. Keep taking action, keep taking action, keep taking actions, keep scanning, keep your, ex your focus external, stick to the cues in your script. That's a great way to deal with those uh, nerves. Honestly, the perfect answer. There's so many things that I loved about that, and I'll quickly just touch on two things. Uh, the first thing being with the heart rate variability, Val and I both smiled because when you said that, we, we immediately thought about, we both use Whoop, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with. Gareth Bell uses it um, and it talks about heart rate variability and it's actually insane to look at the difference in days between your stressful days and your non-stressful days. And you might have the exact same metrics, the same strain, the same workload, everything like that. Your heart rate's the same, your resting heart rate's the same, but your HRV can dictate your recovery, your thoughts, your mood, everything. And I always, before I go to sleep, I do three minutes of the HRV breathing. And this, over time, has trained my HRV to actually be quite a progressive um, number that I've been able to train. And I think that it's, it's, it's great. It's great for our listeners to hear this, how it's the perfect way to sculpt yourself. If this is something that you need to work on, just what you said there has all the answers. And it, it, it's amazing. And the next point that I'll quickly say, which actually fits into my next question for you, which is, I again, it was such a great answer that this fed in perfectly to my next question of which you mentioned how the perception of nerves is merely a perception, correct? It, it's the same thing is that heart rate is elevated, but what you are putting and what you are claiming as that feeling is the actual differentiating factor. And now my next question for you is how the perception of negative thoughts, I guess it's the perception of negative thoughts, right? How they are actually sometimes good, like the perception should be reframed, right? So how can we use the perception of negative thoughts to, I guess, you don't necessarily need to give attention to them, correct, all the time, because negative thoughts, are, I, mean, I believe you are familiar with the term, the, the chimp, right? The chimp brain. Um, so the question is how the perception of negative thoughts can be reconstructed. Good question. So <clears throat> um, I... I um, I think I'm not too sure if I'll answer this in t to your question. I, I I don't know. I will try to, or in the way that you might like me to. But I I, I will say this: is that um, let's start here. We're all human beings. We're starting at a slightly deeper level here. We're all human beings, and as human beings, we all experience sensations, feelings, emotions, and thoughts. Look at it that way, from the deepest level to the uh, surface level. We all experience sensations, bodily sensations, bodily feelings, emotions, right the way through to thoughts. 
We experience these. Now, that word to use is really important. They emerge. They happen to us out of the blue or based on what's going on in the world around us. So if we come back to football here, I can be playing football and I suddenly experience a thought. I suddenly experience a feeling, an emotion. Now, I have this. I use this term. I don't use the chimp as a model, but I use this term ants. A-N-T-S. The A stands for automatic. The N stands for negative. The T stands for thoughts. Automatic negative thoughts. Automatic being that these thoughts happen to us. And when I talk to players about automatic negative thoughts, ants, ants, automatic negative thoughts, I also lump in emotions and feelings. Automatic negative thoughts, emotions and feelings. Right? You are going to have ants. They exist. They, they are going to happen to you. That's how, how, that's how we function as human beings. We play, or we go about our everyday life, and we have lots of thoughts, feelings, emotions, sensations. They happen to us. They pop into our head or they slide through our body. We experience them. And plenty of those are going to be what somebody might say are negative. Okay. But... Here's the thing. In many respects, a skillful response to ants is understanding that we're going to have ants. It's asking yourself, is this ant going to help me? Is this an ant that is like, oh, God, this, this strike is so quick, so strong. Wow, I'm playing awful today. I'm not, I've got no chance against this striker. This, that's an ant I would say that we don't want. And we've got to squash that ant quickly. So our perception of that and in that moment has to be, no, come on, slush that, right. Get out of my head, next plate, whatever it is, the kind of things that we've been talking about. Keep great body language, like stay on the move, stay on my toes. I'll give myself a chance to get to, to get on top of this striker. That might be a basic thing that we might start saying to ourselves in that moment. We're squashing that and because that's unhelpful. Mm. I think... Let's use the same example. I don't think that ant or series of ants started necessarily unhelpfully. If we're saying to ourselves, wow, this, this striker is quick, is, is, is strong. Okay, what are we going to do about that? That's a useful ant because that's our body and brain basically saying, danger, this striker is good. This striker is going to humiliate us here. Right, you need to do something about this. So I'm going to grab hold of that ant and go, okay, all right. The squashing process with that ant is essentially, yeah, the striker is big and strong. Okay, these are the things I'm going to do. Okay, I'm going to keep a little bit more of a gap from that striker. I'm going to stay a bit more on my toes and basically keep an arm's length and maybe um, when I can get in front of that striker and all the things you guys know much more about than I do. But if it, the ant is there for a reason, it's also to, to, to alert us to danger. And so the interpretation, the perception of that has to be pretty pretty quick, pretty strong. How are we going to squash our ants? Are we going to squash our ants by going, no, come on, stop, next action, whatever it is? Or is it squashing the ant? Is it, okay, I've got to brainstorm some solutions here. That's a useful ant to have. So um, I think, I, you know, and we can take that to off the pitch as well. There's nothing wrong with having ants off the pitch if those ants are helping us to take action you know if we're lazing in bed and we should have gone up gotten up half an hour ago and i'm having ants there and it, those ants are like oh, come on we've got to get up here then that those are good ants those are healthy ants those those are helpful ants it's just the unhelpful ones that we need to squash and that's down to our perception to negotiate with themselves ourselves to catch them and and do something about them does that make sense? I'm not too sure if it speaks to your question, but that's a, a thought I would give your listeners. Again, genuinely perfect. I think that because the question kind of fed into the last one a little bit, yeah, you've also completely addressed it because what I was, what I really wanted to hear was how the hardwiring of the human being is survival mechanism, right? Yes, yes. So-called negative thoughts are there to keep us safe. And what the negative thoughts, so-called negative thoughts, right? The ants, they can, you can do one of two things typically, right? You can use them 
as, okay, well, let's say if the striker is fast and you can either say, well, he's so much better than me, what am I going to do? You can either feed into that and you're almost, yep. you're almost giving into that ant, right? But what yep. the correct thing and the perception of that, people need to understand that the perception could be easily flipped for that ant to actually help them, right? So if, as you were, t as you were saying, the perception could be flipped. So, okay, well, how can I deal with this? Well, okay, maybe if I take two steps backwards, I'm always scared to see where he is, things like this. This is the perception of these ants that can actually help you because at the end of the day, these survival mechanisms, maybe, you know, thousands of years ago when it was the lion who was a bit faster than you and maybe you needed to take two steps back before you quickly dropped everything and ran. Okay, it's a football game. It's not life or death. But that ant is actually there. It's it's a response. And the perception of it is actually the main thing that we need to focus on. So again, it was it was a, the perfect answer. And I, I love the term ants. And I think that's definitely something that all of our listeners will use because in a game, you will have ants. Full of ants. And in, in life, in life. And I think that it was a great point that you mentioned, okay, well, I'm in bed. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit lazy and I have this, this voice in the back of my head. That's actually not a bad thing. You should have, everyone has it. It's the way that you use that. You might think, oh, okay, I have, I've had this thought, but I just want to stay in bed. I want to be lazy. I'm just going to waste all my time. No, the perception of that thought should be flipped. And it's actually, it, it, it's, it's great if you actually take action on that. Yeah. And that, yeah, go on, sorry. No, 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 I was going to go to the next question, so you can go. No, I, I just, I, I love everything that you said. You've eloquently said it. Um, I think you, you, I wonder if a nice little phrase here is use it or lose it. Use the ant or lose the ant. And I think that that's where when I sat down to write my books, having worked in a couple of Premier League clubs, and this is going back, I wrote my first book 11 years ago. I wanted to create tools that players could use um, excuse me, there you go, untimely sneeze, uh, could use to be able to do multiple things, one of which was to squash out. You know, I can use my match script. So I might be a defender playing against this big, strong striker, and I don't necessarily have to brainstorm in that moment. I might have to, but it's very much, okay, I'm having this ant, I'm going to squash this ant by getting back to my script in that moment. So I, that's where I think players need these tools and techniques to take with them onto the pitch so that when they do experience ants you know i can immediately squash them if i need to by getting back to my script as an example so i just wanted to say that brilliant brilliant absolutely brilliant uh my final question is this is a it's quite a big question and we don't have to go completely into it but something that about psychology right it's it's such a crazy thing and i think a good way of explaining it is i don't know your next thought you don't know my next thought my next thought could have been a habitual thought it could be a thought where i'm completely conscious right there's so many variations in psychology there's it's not necessarily it can't be necessarily genetic either sometimes there's there's so many so many crazy things about psychology right so my my last question is consistency how can an athlete stay consistent in their performances because for me i can have the most consistent game regiment and schedule and everything like that everything stays the same the exact week but just because of human psychology one week i might think oh well today's my day where i'm gonna stuff up and long and behold it's the day and Every other week where I've been doing the exact same process, I have the exact same principles, my thoughts have been completely fine. So how can athletes use mental strategies and understand human psychology to actually stay consistent? So this almost gets to the heart of my consultancy practice with players across many levels, many ages. And the way I would describe this is that you, the way I work on this with players is understanding that there is going to be a certain degree of inconsistency 
of performance. And when I say performance, I mean performance outcomes, mm -hmm. such as completed passes, winning tackles, um, you know, the quality of your performance, if you like. Understanding that there is going to be a certain degree of inconsistency there and accepting that you cannot fully control your performance, not least because certainly in football, you have an opposition and you have teammates and your performance can and will be heavily influenced by them. Um, not least because of that, but also because internally you are, as we've described already, a mesh, a mishmash of thoughts, feelings, emotions, sensations, our attention goes in and out, broad, wide, narrow. We're all over the place as human beings, our consciousness. And so the notion that we can be eight out of 10 all the time, well, one could argue maybe, maybe Lionel Messi at times has hit that eight, nine for his standard of what eight, nine looks like. Maybe you could argue that. I don't, I don't know his games well enough. But by and large, we're going to be inconsistent to a degree. That's where it starts. That sounds like that's a negative message. It's not. It's a practical, pragmatic message. But then it's followed by this. It's understanding there will be a degree of inconsistency, especially around my performance outcomes, and I can't completely control my performance in terms of my performance outcomes. But what I've got to do, therefore, is create a performance process. I'm going to use your word of process, a performance process that incorporates my HPM, my high performance mindset. I've got to work out what that looks like. That can include a match script. It can include how I squash ants. It can include other techniques and tricks that we've talked about and I talk about in my books and in my academy and you know my work. And then it's understanding that your main inner story, your main narrative every day and in before every game revolves around this performance process, this HPM, this high performance mindset process, more so than performance outcomes. So how this plays out, is it very differently to what people think a good narrative is? Most people will say it's got to win, got to win, got to win, got to perform, got to perform, got to perform. I take players away from that to give themselves the best chance to be consistent. In fact, in extreme cases, and I've got some clients now who play at the very highest level of the game, where I take them completely away from winning, losing, so they don't care if they win or lose. And believe it or not, they care. they're carefree. They're not careless. They're carefree about their performance outcomes. I can't control my performance, so I'm not going to strive to. But I am going to be absolutely brutal with my performance process. I'm going to keep great body language. I'm going to stick to the plays in my script. I'm going to be nonstop on my self-talk. I'm going to be brilliant there. I know exactly what I want to do in terms of in possession, out possession, I'm going to have my competitive persona out there with me. I'm going to squash my ants quickly. That's what I demand for myself. That's what I expect for myself. That's what I'm going to be brutal on myself with. That's what I'm going to be relentless doing. I accept I might give the ball away. I accept I might lose some duels. I accept I might not get on the end of every cross. I accept I might miss a chance to score. I accept we might lose 3-0. I accept what my teammates do. But I refuse to accept anything other than my best possible or my best performance process. My best performance process, which is much more controllable than performance outcome, gives me my best chance to have my best possible performance outcome. My best possible passing, my best possible challenges, my best possible shooting, my best possible 1v1 defending, my best possible position, consistency of position, my best possible everything around performance. That's all I can ask for myself. That word possible is vital. Because every player goes into a game by and large and goes, well, I want to have my best performance. I want to win. I want to have my best possible. I want to have, I want, excuse me, I want to win. I want to have my best performance. 
I would imagine 99.9% .9 of players go into games thinking that, and I'm putting to everybody on planet Earth, and I don't care if you're Pep Guardiola, Jose Mourinho, or you guys, or whoever, that is not incorrect, but it's not sophisticated enough. It's not broad enough, and it doesn't take into account human frailties and how human beings function because you cannot control outcome and performance performance outcome. You have got to get into performance process and you've got to be brutal on yourself with performance process, which is more specific and more controllable. Yeah, I mean... Again, try, try and get that one in your head because that's what I'm doing every day with players. It's honestly a crazy answer and it's... For me, I understand everything that you're saying there. And for maybe someone who can't understand completely everything that you're saying, I think for anyone to take away what you're saying there, it's the focus on the controllables and the processes that you have rather than focusing on the end product. I guess, it, again, it's it's kind of feeding into the, uh, the second point that Val asked you with visualization. It's focusing on the things right in front of you that you have direct control over right now. And rather than framing the game as, okay, well, this is going to be my best game of my life or I want to perform and hit this metric. Rather than thinking of this, it's the processes that you have right now. Yes, as we've been saying, humans are humans, right? You will have these ads, but the way you deal with them, this is what stays consistent because you can actually control the reaction and response every time where you can't necessarily control what the other player is doing every time so it's the response and the reaction to the things in your immediate control a hundred percent spot on very eloquently and simply put i'm going to add one thing yeah. it's and what you've described and what i've described is damn hard to do for several reasons, but not least because sport, in sport, we are socialised into outcome and performance. Everything tends to be about outcome, winning, losing, and performance outcomes, the quality of my performance, rather than the performance process. The world surrounds us with these things. And also... Naturally, part of being a human being, especially when we take our game seriously, is that we, you know, we're, we feel we're being judged, which sometimes we are, maybe often we are, and we judge ourselves because we do want to be the best that we can possibly be. So in many respects, you eloquently and simply put it as focus on what's here right now, what's controllable, you know, what's, what's, what, what's in front of us. Absolutely. But... Or, and that's damn difficult to do because the way we're designed as human beings is not just to experience ants and all those thoughts, feelings, sensations, emotions, but is to judge ourselves in our environment at any given time and be conscious and aware of our social surroundings and how we're being judged. That's, that's what tends to happen to human functioning. So, there we go. It's a constant challenge. It's a constant challenge for the both of you. It's a constant challenge for me in my domain. It's a constant challenge for us all. But that's my answer to you is stick to that performance process. Know what that is. Stick to it like super glue and keep doing that. And accept that from time to time, you're not going to have great games. That's going to happen. Acceptance, self-acceptance has to be a part of that journey. If you're going to try to find as much consistency as possible. Brilliant. On honest, brilliant answer. Um, before I quickly ask you uh, the wrap up question, Val, Great. is there anything that you want to add or ask Dan uh, before the last wrap up question? Um, no, not any more questions, but I quickly want to touch on something. Um, I listened to the last part of or your questions that you asked Dan, um, but it was incredibly to witness uh, that I learned something from myself. Uh, first of all, my two biggest takeaways from today are the match script, setting yourself some some small goals for the training session ahead, uh, and the ants part. Um, 
controlling your negative thoughts, not going too hard into it, and in general taking action and, and not like um, wasting your time with it or getting too into it. Love it. Thanks, Val. Awesome. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. It's, it's so good that we can just learn so much. And again, I really want everyone listening right now to really understand all of this information that Dan is able to bring to us and all the experiences that he's got from people at the highest level, right? We're talking Premier League footballs. We're talking top MMA fighters. I'm, it's honestly amazing that we've got Dan here and speaking with him today because there are so many lessons and we're extremely grateful for your time, Dan. It's, it's amazing. And last thing that I want to ask you is what are three ways that you sculpt yourself as an individual every day? Really good question. Um, I definitely strive to set up certain habits. I think I could do better at doing that. I need to be a better sculptor of habits. But I've definitely got my daily um, responsibilities to my um, commit to to the commitment that I have to my pr profession. Um, so that might be a certain amount of reading. It might be a certain amount of social media work um, and so on and so forth. So definitely um, that. Um, I definitely try to practice what I preach and as much as I like vow, I, I do um, heart rate variability stuff tends to be my go-to actually um, to manage my nervous system. So I try best to manage my nervous system um utilizing my breathing my body language my self-talk and i think the third thing is movement to be honest i'm not a professional athlete anymore um so i'm much older than you guys i'm in my mid 40s <laughs> and when you reach your mid 40s and you're not playing professional sport you're you're conscious of of, of things so i try to sculpt myself by to a degree sculpting my body I don't quite have your bodies, guys, but I, I, I do that. So movement is very important. So, you know, and I think along, alongside movement, you talk about diet and, and sleep there. So I think habits for work, um, my nervous system and movement for um, uh, my heart and my, um, my, 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 my shape and my flexibility and stuff like that. Those would be the three things I'm most focused on. Um, I probably should have said something about my relationship with my wife and being kind to her, <laughs> which is up there. So that kind of sculpting thing as well. Number four. Uh, that, that's all. That's first, obviously, guys. <laughs> uh, no, that, that, that's thrown into the mix. But uh, those would be the top three in terms of, I suppose, personal effectiveness, effectiveness and development. Yeah, it, it's brilliant to hear from such a great mind, ways that you can sculpt yourself and for anyone listening, ways that they can keep their self accountable and keep keep sculpting themselves to become better and better every single day because that's our message at Sculpted. We want we want to take the bad, we want to take the good. We want to make sure that at the end, at the at the end of whatever we're doing, there's a grand sculpture. You can see the cracks. You can see everything that's been the all of the work, all of the purpose and the intention behind everything that we do is to create what's in front of you. And hopefully at the end, and I see it in there, I see the grand sculpture, right? That's what we want. And that's what we're trying to get out. And I'm going to wrap that up here because honestly, guys, this has been a great episode into so much knowledge and there's there's so many takeaways here and I'm going to write up, there's going to be a lot on Instagram that I'm going to have to write up about, a lot of summaries, a lot of photos, a lot of a lot of videos, all right, because this episode has so much in it and Dan, thank you so much again for your time. It has honestly been amazing, genuinely really, really amazing. I honestly couldn't have expected anything more, like genuinely amazing. <laughs> So it's been a pleasure, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. And guys, follow 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 Dan on all social media, right? Uh listen to his podcast. I mean, I'm I think I started actually listening to you, Dan, in COVID, I believe. Uh so probably three years ago. So listen to his podcast. There's a, go back, Dan, you've got so many episodes, right? Like I think I started listening to you in like episode maybe like hundred and eighty. There's so there's yeah. so much, right? Like, listen to this. I, I know then you, you have excellent guests on your episode uh, episodes as well. So there is so much to learn from that. And look at his books as well. He's got three brilliant books, and yeah, 
thank you so much again, Dad. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you.